going to do a two-part series tonight and next Thursday uh, about heaven. Because that is a subject I love to talk about. That's a topic the Bible addresses many, many, many times. And heaven is a place that we all need to know about because if we're a Christian, that's where we're going to end up one day. And you want to be ready for where you're going. You know, if you take a trip, you want to know a little bit about where you're going. You know, what clothes do I take? What's a good place to eat? Where should I stay? What site should I go see? And you know, we prepare ourselves for a trip that we take. Well, we want to be prepared for heaven because heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. So let's talk about heaven and we're going to turn to Colossians chapter 3 tonight. Turn over there with me if you would. Colossians chapter 3. Heard about an 85-year-old couple who had been married for almost 60 years who incredibly died on the same day. They'd been in good health, actually, for the last 10 years, mainly as a result of the wife's interest in health food and exercise. So they reached the pearly great gates, and uh, there are no greats, gates. They come to the pearly gates, and they're met, of course, by St. Peter. And he takes them to their brand new mansion waiting for them in heaven. It's equipped with a beautiful kitchen, a master bath suite, and a sauna and jacuzzi. As they're ooing and aahing, the old man says to Peter, how much is this going to cost? Peter says, it's not going to cost anything, man. This is heaven. And then they looked out in their backyard and it's a championship golf course that changes every day resembling one of the great golf courses on planet Earth. And the old man says, what are the green fees? Peter says, there's no green fees. It's heaven. Everything is free. Then they take the couple to this massive buffet lunch. And it had all the food that the old man wanted to eat but couldn't eat. Mexican food, Italian food, nachos with lots of cheese, pizza, hamburgers, all that good stuff. That's the stuff I like too, by the way. And the old guy's looking at all of this food and he says, well, where's the low fat and low cholesterol tables? Peter says, that's the great thing. We don't have low fat tables. We don't have low cholesterol. Eat whatever you want and you never get fat and you never get sick. With that, the old man takes his hat off, throws it on the ground and starts stomping on it. And Peter and his, the man's wife are looking at him like, what is wrong with you? They said, what, what is happening? He looks at the wife and he says, this is your fault. He says, if you hadn't been feeding me those blasted bran muffins for the last 10 years, I would have been here sooner. <laughs> this is a true story. It's also a bad joke. But heaven, of course, is no joke. It's a real place, as I said, for real people to do real things. Now, how many of you believe in heaven? Raise your hand if you believe in heaven, right? Okay, well, most Americans actually do believe in a place called heaven, 81%. Uh, the stats are a little lower for hell. 69% believe in a place called hell. But I think deep down inside, we long for a place we've never been to before. Have you ever traveled for a while, especially overseas, and found yourself really homesick? wanting to get home again, especially those that serve in the armed forces or those that do business overseas. They can't wait to get back home again. I think deep down inside, God has pre-wired us to be homesick for a place we've never been to before. And that place is heaven. We long for it. In fact, the Bible even tells us over in Ecclesiastes 3.11 that God has set eternity in our hearts. It was Augustine who said, quote, you formed us for yourself and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in you. The great writer C.S. Lewis, speaking of heaven, said it was the secret signature of each soul. Lewis continues, there have been times when I think we do not desire heaven, but more often I find myself wondering whether in our heart of hearts if we have ever desired anything else, it's a secret signature of each soul, the incommunicable and unappeasable want, end quote. I love that, that it's this longing deep inside of us, like the story of the little boy who was flying this kite and it went up higher and higher and soon you couldn't see it, it was obscured by the cloud and someone said, boy, how do you know that kite's still up there? 
the little guy said, I can still feel its tug. And I think deep down inside, we feel the tug of heaven. And it goes back to our childhood. I think even our excitement about Christmas, in a way, is a longing for heaven. There's something about Christmas, apart from all the commercialism of it, and also apart from the fact that it starts in August now, um, <laughs> that, that really is a glimpse of heaven, is it not? All the beautiful lights, the angels, the beautiful songs, like I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus. No, not those ones. The beautiful Christmas songs that we sing. And it's just like a little glimpse of heaven. It's sort of like a promise. Of course, Christmas cannot deliver on the promise, but Christ can and heaven can. I remember as a little boy, to me, Disneyland was like heaven on earth. Uh, I don't feel that way anymore, but I did a long time ago. And I think it was due in part to my, you know, horrible upbringing. And I would watch this show on television called The Wonderful World of Disney. And then when color TV came out, yes, I'm that old, um, they changed it to The Wonderful World of Color. And we were just amazed to watch this on our screen, the, these uh, programs that Disney would do. But then Walt Disney told us about this park he was building and it was going to be the happiest place on earth. And, and so when I would visit uh, Disney, Disneyland, it was like heaven to me. Because, I mean, I, I felt it was just such an incredible place. And I was so sad to leave. In fact, you know you're a kid when you go to Disneyland and your favorite part is when you arrive and you know you're an adult when you go to Disneyland because your favorite time is when you leave, right? Is that true? So that's how I used to feel about Disneyland and I think it's just sort of a glimpse of something much greater that is coming. We long for heaven and the Bible teaches that when a Christian dies they go immediately to heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So if you have loved ones who have died in faith, they are in heaven right now. Do they see us down here? Are they watching us up there? Do they know what we're going through down here? We'll talk about that in our next message because those are very important questions. And some of my answers may surprise you a little bit actually. But yes, it is true. The Bible teaches we will go straight to heaven. Now I came across an atheist website a while ago. I don't usually read that many atheist websites, but from time to time I'll check in on what other people are saying. And it turns out that they were quoting something I said on their atheist website. And here's what it said. Uh, they quoted me rightly with these words. They said that I said, quote, when a Christian dies, it's a direct flight to heaven. There are no stopovers. The moment we take our last breath on earth, we take our first breath in heaven, we go into the presence of God. That's exactly what I said. And they were outraged by this. And here was their response. Going to heaven after death is assumed. Not only does he start with this unsubstantiated and onerous assumption, but he goes on in more detail about the precise state of affairs that take place in heaven once you arrive. And what evidence does Greg Laurie have to bolster these claims? Nothing at all, just a bunch of Bible quotes. <laughs> That's right. Just a bunch of Bible quotes. By the way, I love that. I stand by that. That's right, just a bunch of Bible quotes. I'm building everything I believe on just a bunch of Bible quotes. I'm building my hope on Jesus Christ and what he tells me in his word. Now listen, I don't expect atheists to understand the hope of a Christian. It's hard for them to wrap their mind around the fact that we have such a strong hope. But this is something that God gives to us, isn't it? It's a quiet confidence. It's a supernatural certainty. And where do we find this hope? We find it from Scripture. Or as the atheist website said, a bunch of Bible quotes. That's why it's a good thing to memorize the Bible and to fill your mind with what the Bible says. And the Bible actually has a lot to say about heaven. In fact, Psalm 119 says, you are my refuge, my shield, your word is my only source of hope. That's one of the reasons the scripture was given to us to begin with, to give us hope. 
Romans 15, 4 says, such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us. They give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises. And by the way, the word that is used there for hope is a word that can be translated a strong and confident expectation. And we all have that. And I have the hope that one day I will go to heaven. And uh, it's something I actually like to talk about. I was asked in a TV interview a while ago by the interviewer, why do you talk about heaven all the time? He said, I've noticed in your sermons, uh, I'll see you on TV or hear you on the radio, and you're always talking about heaven. And I thought, really? Well, good. That's a good thing to be always talking about. I wasn't aware of that. But I'm not embarrassed by that or ashamed of that. Because really when it's said and done, what's more important than that? Than where we spend our eternal destiny? I mean, I want to do everything to help you come into a relationship with God and find that beautiful and meaningful relationship He has for you on this earth. But when it's all said and done, the statistics on death are quite impressive. One out of every one person will die. And then there's the afterlife. And the afterlife lasts a lot longer than this life on earth. Maybe we should call our time on earth the before life. We put so much focus on the afterlife. No, the before life is short. The afterlife is forever. Yes, it's true. I admit it. I want to take as many people to heaven with me as I possibly can. And so we need to know about heaven. <clears throat> I've always studied heaven, always been fascinated by it. I wouldn't say I'm an expert on it at all, but I would say I'm a student of it. And I probably became a greater student of it, no doubt, in 2008 when my son went to heaven. He beat me to heaven. My son Christopher was 33 at the time. Now, Christopher and I used to race each other on the beach. And he was a runner. He was out in track and field. He was very good. But I was okay as a runner in high school. And so uh, I was a bit younger. And so we'd be on the beach and, and I'd race him all the time. I'd say, let's race to that mark down there. And you know, and I was better at short distance and he was better at long distance, so I always picked a distance that favored me, right? Because I would run out of steam quicker than he would. Let's run to that mark. And so, ready, go! And I you know, would run and I'd, I'd get ahead of him and I beat you again, you didn't beat me yet. And one day we're walking along the beach, I said, okay, I picked a spot, let's go. And your mark had said go and off we went and he beat me. Oh, it finally happened. Well, that happened in life too. You know, I expected that I would go way before him to heaven. In fact, written on his tombstone are the words, I fought the good fight, I kept the faith, I finished the course. And that is what we're all going to do, and we don't know how long that course will be. Some of us may run that course for 85, 95 years. Some of us may run that course for 45 years. Some of us may run the course for 18 years. Some of us may run it for 64 years. Some may run it for 33 years, like my son. We don't know. None of us know. That's why we want to run as well as we can and as hard as we can while we can. Because one day will be our last day. And then we're in eternity. And then we're standing before the Lord. So what is heaven like? Let's talk about that a little bit here. In Colossians chapter three, I'm gonna read two verses. Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. We'll stop there. So we are to set our hearts and we are to set our minds on things above. This phrase, set your mind, can be translated think, or more thoroughly, have this inner disposition. Let me put it another way. The verse is actually saying simply, think heaven. Think heaven. That's something we're all supposed to do as Christians. And by the way, the verb that's used in this verse is in the present tense, so it can be translated keep thinking heaven, or keep thinking about heaven, or keep seeking heaven. Put it all together. It's saying constantly be seeking and thinking about heaven. You see, our feet must be on earth, but our minds and our hearts can be in heaven. But if we're honest, many of us have gone an entire day without a single thought about heaven. 
And that's not a good thing. We should always be thinking about it. Warren Wiersbe, a great Bible commentator, said, quote, for the Christian, heaven isn't simply a destination. It's a motivation. You say, okay, well, that, that's fine, but you know, how do I think about a place I've never been to before? How do I wrap my mind around a place I know so little about? Well, you need to learn about heaven and see what the Bible says about Scripture. Because when you're thinking about heaven and you're seeking heaven, you will be a heavenly-minded person in the best sense of that phrase. I know it's used to critique people. Oh, they're so heavenly-minded. They're no earthly good. And I know a lot of people who are so earthly-minded, they're no heavenly good. And I think if you're heavenly minded in the right way, you'll be of the greatest earthly good. Fact of the matter is, those that think the most of the next life do the most in this one. Because if I believe there's an afterlife, and I believe there's a reward waiting for me for my faithfulness, won't that make me want to serve the Lord? And if I believe in an afterlife, and I believe there's a potential judgment for me, won't that make me want to fear God and avoid sin? So you see how my belief in the afterlife affects me in this life? But if on the other hand, I don't believe there's a reward waiting, why do anything for anyone but me? And if I don't think there's a future judgment out there, why can't I do whatever the heck I want to do to whoever I want to do it to? Because there'll be no eternal repercussion. So as you can see, your thinking about the afterlife has a dramatic effect on you in this life. So let's just start with what is heaven? What is it? Well, it's the dwelling place of God. All right, where is heaven? Well, we know it's up. <laughs> we know that there's a third heaven. Uh, the Bible talks about three heavens. And uh, the first heaven would just be basically you walk outside to look up, you see the sky. The second heaven would be the solar system. And the third heaven is that supernatural realm. But it may be closer than we think. I think we think it's so far away, you know. And maybe it's just right next to us in a way. It's really another dimension. You see, right now we live in the physical dimension. But at the same time, we coexist with an eternal dimension. It's the dimension of God and the devil, of angels and demons, of the supernatural world. A great illustration of this is found in the book of Kings with the prophet Elisha and his servant Gehazi. Uh, they were surrounded by their enemies. They were closing in with chariots and armed soldiers. And Gehazi started to freak out and panic. And he said, what are we going to do, Master? He actually woke Elisha up. Elisha said, oh, whatever, okay. Lord, just open his eyes. And his eyes were open, and he saw the supernatural forces of God all around him. And he discovered that they had more on their side than the enemy had on their side. And right now, we're surrounded by this supernatural world. The Bible says that the angel of the Lord encamps around those that fear him. And we may even have guardian angels. I'm not sure of this, but I think you can make a fairly good case for it. At least maybe children have them. Because Jesus talks about how uh, our little children have their angels. Uh, so it may be that we have personal angels and it may be we just have angels that just do God's bidding, but they're working around us every single day. God's at work. So this supernatural realm, this place called heaven, we don't know where it is, but it is where God is. And that is the most important thing of all because really the greatest thing about heaven is going to be seeing God. Now that's it. It's seeing God. That's more important than anything else. My friend Randy Alcorn has written the definitive book on heaven. And I often quote from it when I teach on this topic. I was just texting with Randy this morning. But um, Randy writes in his book, Heaven, quote, we may imagine we want a thousand different things, but God is the one we really long for. His presence brings satisfaction. His absence brings thirst and longing. Our longing for heaven is a longing for God. Being with God is the heart and soul of heaven. Every other heavenly pleasure will derive from it and be secondary to his presence, which is God's greatest gift to us himself. And that's just a great thing to remember, that that's why heaven is so appealing. Now let's answer some questions about heaven. What is heaven like? What is heaven like? Because we try to understand it and compare it to something. Well, short answer, heaven is amazing. Heaven is awesome. Heaven will exceed your 
wildest dreams. Let me begin by simply saying heaven is a real place. Jesus said in John 14, I've gone to prepare a place for you. Now I think the problem is we form our view of heaven from, well, movies, TV shows, songs, uh, images we've seen in art, and, and usually those are not biblically accurate images. It really does kind of look like a, a boring place. Big billowy clouds, uh, people just laying around, plucking harps, little fat babies with wings hovering over us. I, I guess they're little baby angels. I'm not sure what they are. And uh, it's sort of almost presented as a long nap, which for some people may sound very appealing. I don't know. But I don't know about you, but I like to be active. I like to do things. I like to go out and see things and experience life. And trust me when I tell you, and we'll get into this next time more, but there's going to be so much that we will do in heaven. But it's a real place. It's not a boring place. A science fiction writer Isaac Asimov once wrote, quote, I don't believe in an afterlife. So I don't have to spend my whole life fearing hell or fearing heaven even more. For whatever the tortures of hell, I think the boredom of heaven would be even worse, end quote. Wow. Well, I know that he is now on the other side, and I guarantee he knows there's an afterlife. Uh, Stephen Hawking, uh, the great scientist, uh, died a while ago, and they've just released his final book that he had been writing when he died. And one of the great revelations in the book that was a headline on a lot of news sites today is Stephen Hawking says there is no God. No one rules the universe. Really? Well, I think he's changed his opinion, quite frankly. I don't need Stephen Hawking or anybody else to tell me if there's a God or not. I know there's a God. And he's made that so clear and so obvious. And you know it as well. But yes, heaven is amazing. And it's certainly not Boring. Again, a real place for real people to do real things. Again, to quote from Randy Alcorn's book, Heaven. I love this picture that he gives. And, and Alcorn, what's so great about him is um, he's a theologian, but he writes creatively. He writes novels. So he has a great way of uh, painting a picture, but with theological accuracy. In other words, it's accurate to what the scripture says. And so here's something Randy writes in his book. Think of friends or family members who love Jesus and are with him right now. Picture them with you, walking together in this place. All of you have powerful bodies, stronger than those of an Olympic, Olympic decathlete. You're laughing, playing, talking, and reminiscing. You reach up to a tree to pick an apple or an orange and take a bite. It's so sweet, it's startling. You've never tasted anything so good. Now you see someone coming toward you. It's Jesus with a big smile on his face. You fall to your knees and worship and he pulls you up and embraces you, end quote. Isn't that beautiful? That, that's accurate. That's accurate. Because that fits the biblical descriptions of heaven. A real place, real things, real people, recognizing one another, not floating around in clouds with fat babies with wings. We're active, we're doing things, we're experiencing things, we're even learning new things in heaven. So heaven is a place. Also, heaven is described in the Bible as a paradise. A paradise. Remember when Jesus hung on the cross next to the thief who came to a census? <clears throat> he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say? Truly, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me where? In paradise. He was describing heaven. And it's funny because after Paul died for a time, he went to heaven and he called it paradise. A lot of people don't know that the Apostle Paul died. And we don't know when exactly it happened. Uh, but it may have been on one of his preaching adventures when uh, he was stoned and thought dead. And, uh, and that may have been the moment when he went to the third heaven and wrote briefly about it in 2 Corinthians that I'll read to you in just a moment. And he came back again. And I just wonder what happened on the other side. So here's Paul. He's stoned. Not that kind of stoned. Um, and he's in heaven. And it's amazing. And there's Jesus. And he's so excited to be there. And the Lord might have said, so Paul, I have some good news and some bad news. Well, good news and bad news, what? 
yeah, well, first the good news, this is heaven, and you'll be coming back here again. Again? Eh, it's the bad news. Down on earth, there's some believers praying for you to be resurrected. Lord, Paul might have said, don't listen to their prayers. <laughs> They're sinners. I don't want to go back. Trust me when I tell you, no one who is in heaven would ever want to come back to earth even if given the choice. So you're saying, where is this in the Bible? It is, and I'm making this all up. I'm just saying maybe it happened. Meanwhile, back on earth, oh, Lord, raise Paul up. Oh, Lord, bring Paul back to us. Oh, Lord, we need Paul. Suddenly the, the, the color returns to his face. His hand begins to move. He clenches his fist. Bam! I would have hit someone. Whose idea was it to pray for me to be raised from the dead? Listen, however it happened, or whenever it happened, we know this much. Paul died. He went to heaven, and he came back. And he didn't write a book about it. So what about all those books about heaven? Can we trust them? I don't know. Should I? There's only one book I trust. And that's the Bible. Now I'll look at some of these books and I find them interesting. Writing on unicorns over rainbows and all these things they say they see. And, and I'm not going to say they're making it up, though I think some of them are. I'm not going to say that uh, none of this happened. Maybe something happened to them. I'm not really sure. But I'll say this much. I would never base my belief about heaven on the basis of someone who wrote a book about it. But I do believe what the Bible says. And it's interesting because one man who actually did go to heaven and return to the earth had actually very little to say about it. Here's what Paul writes in uh, 2 Corinthians 12. And I'm reading from a modern translation. Just listen. He says, I knew a man 14 years ago was seized by Christ and he was swept into ecstasy to the heights of heaven. I don't know if this took place in the body or out of it. Only God knows. I also know that this man was hijacked into paradise. There's that word, paradise. Again, whether he's in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. And then he says, there he heard the unspeakable spoken, but he was forbidden to tell what he heard. Isn't that interesting? He says, I'll tell you this much. It was paradise. And the word that he uses for paradise is a word that speaks of a royal garden. And I don't know if there's anything we can think of that compares to what Paul is referring to. He's referring to the kind of a garden you would see in a royal estate. You know, uh, what is the closest thing we could point to? What, Rogers Gardens? Who knows? But it's just something amazing, something awe-inspiring, something that makes your jaw drop. Wow, the beauty of it. He says, it was like paradise. That's the word he uses. So heaven's a paradise. Number two, heaven's a city. Heaven's a city, Hebrews 13, 14 says, here we do not have an enduring city, but we're looking for a city that is to come. Hebrews eleven ten says of heaven that this city has an architect and a builder. Now cities are real places. You go to different cities in the world and they all have unique features. I've had the opportunity to visit a lot of amazing cities. Uh, Jerusalem, Rome, Paris, Aliso Viejo. Um, <laughs> so there might be a, I don't know why I picked on Aliso Viejo. I just had to pick some local city. But, uh, you know, you go to some cities and you remember a certain thing about it, right? Paris is called the city of lights. Jerusalem is called the city of gold. You know, so cities are real places. There's neighborhoods, there's streets, there's activities, there's places to get food. There's places to get good coffee. There's beautiful parks to walk in. So think of the best city you've ever been to, but without all the bad stuff. No crime, no urban decay, uh, nothing that would be threatening to you in any way, shape, or form. Not cars trying to run you down like New York City. Uh, but the best you've ever experienced in a city. You're saying, Greg, are you actually telling me that when we're in heaven, we might go and sit down and have a meal? Why not? The Bible talks about eating in heaven. Are you actually saying that we could be in heaven and we would go to a concert? Why not? There's going to be some pretty awesome singers up there. Are you telling me, like, when we're in heaven, we, we, we might just go out and do fun stuff? Of course. Do you do fun stuff on earth? No. Well, that's your fault. <laughs> but you can do it in heaven. Heaven is better than earth. Heaven is... Is Earth is just sort of a glimpse of greater things to come. 
I think we think, oh, this is it. This is it. Then I just go to the clouds and float with the fat babies. <laughs> no, no. This is just a glimpse of greater things to come. Earth is the imitation. Heaven is the real thing, not the other way around. Heaven is a paradise. Heaven is a city. And it appears from Revelation 21 and 22 that there's a translucent quality to heaven. It says there, the foundations of city walls were garnished with every precious gem imaginable. The main street of the city was pure gold, translucent as glass. There was no sign of a temple for the Lord God and his Lamb were the temple. The city doesn't need sun or moon or light. Heaven is also described as a country, a country. Hebrews 11, 6 says, now they desire a better that is a heavenly country. God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared a city for them. So there it is, heaven, a country, a city, a garden, a paradise, a real place that we will go to. Now listen, earth is great. Enjoy the beauties of earth. It's created for us by God. Even it's in its diminished state and even with the entrance of sin and the curse and all that, there's still many beautiful things to see here on planet earth that we can enjoy that have been given to us by the Lord. Even Jesus took time to admire a simple flower, didn't he? He picked up a flower and he said, well, look at these flowers, how they grow. They don't work or make their own clothing, yet Solomon, all, Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as one of these. So I think we should enjoy the creation God has given us, but understand there are greater things coming. All right, so we'll talk more about heaven uh, next Thursday night, but let's come back to Colossians chapter three because we're talking about heaven. How should that affect us in the way that we live on earth? So first we read, set your mind and your heart on things above, think about heaven, seek heaven. Now, back in Colossians three, Paul starts with the word, therefore, put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world. Now is the time to get rid of rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you've stripped off your old sinful nature and all of its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. Now look, whenever you read the word, therefore, in the Bible, find out what it's there for. In other words, when a phrase starts with the word therefore, he's drawing on what has been previously said. So again, what was previously said? Hey, set your mind on heaven. Set your heart on heaven. Think a lot about heaven. So with that in mind, therefore. And now he tells us about three categories of sin that can, well, keep us earthbound. Instead of being heavenly minded, we're earth bound. Number one, if you're taking notes, sexual sin can keep you earth bound. Sexual sin. Verse five, Paul mentions sexual immorality and impurity. The word that he uses is the Greek word pornea. Guess what English word we get from that? How we have normalized the word porn, right? We've normalized the word. Oh, she's a porn star. Oh yeah, looking at porn, we make a joke out of it. You watch sitcoms, mainstream sitcoms on television, and they joke openly and consistently about looking at porn. We've so normalized it and made it sort of acceptable, and the Bible warns us against it. Pornea is a root word that just speaks of all kinds of immorality. It's premarital sex, in case you don't know what that is, that's having sex with someone you're not married to. Extramarital sex, that's also having sex with someone you're not married to. Uh, all kinds of sex outside of God's natural order. And so when the word pornea is used, it's talking about a person that fills their mind with sexual imagery and talks about it constantly and ultimately acts on it. So the Bible is warning you to not do that. Don't fill your mind with those things. 
Because if you do, it's like you have a fire and you're pouring fuel on your fire. It's dangerous. And it's one day going to get out of control. And what will happen is a person can only take that stuff in for so long and then they want to start acting on those impulses and get into all kinds of trouble. Need I, do I need to actually say it's a really bad idea to sext someone? Uh, send a sexual image of yourself uh, via text or Snapchat or something else? These are things that are destructive in your life and are not God's plan for your life and things that can ultimately destroy your life. And that's why the Bible warns you about these things. Listen, God invented sex. Sex is amazing. Sex can be blessed, but in one place. And that's when you're married to a person in a monogamous relationship, the end, period. Process it. There's no exceptions. Because all the people come up to me and say, well, the Lord spoke to us and said, it's cool. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. You dreamt that up after you ate too much pizza. God will never contradict his word. And he says that for your own good. He says that for your protection. So don't let that dominate your life. Idolatry can keep us earthbound. You won't be heavenly minded if you're worshiping an idol. And he mentions that as well here in Colossians. Don't let idolatry, which is greed. An idol is anyone, or anyone that takes anyone or anything that takes the place of God in your life. And specifically it says to be a greedy person is idolatry. And by the way, there's two root words here, to have and more. So what does it mean to be a greedy person? It's someone that wants to have more. It's a sin of always wanting more, 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 more. It's never enough. The Bible says hell and destruction is never full and so is the heart of a man never satisfied. And it's not just that I want more, but I want what I have. Now I want what you have. I want yours. I don't just want mine. I want yours too. That's coveting, by the way. And that's the, when the Bible says don't covet your neighbor's wife or their possessions. That, that's coveting something that does not belong to you. And so this is what this is saying. That's idolatry and it can preoccupy your mind. And then thirdly, rage, slander, and dirty language keep us earthbound. Verse eight, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. By the way, the word rage here speaks of a settled and habitual anger with a thought of revenge. This is the person who has the bumper sticker on their car, I don't get mad, I get even. Don't cut that person off. Just give them wide berth, right, on the road, because that, that, and they have gun racks in the back of their car, and Smith and Wesson bumper stickers, and you know. So, you know, you don't want to mess with that person, because there are people out there that are just waiting to get angry about something. Malicious behavior speaks of a boiling agitation of your feelings, a sudden and violent anger. Don't be that person. Slander speaks of speaking ill of others. Man, people slander so much, especially online, because you can do it anonymously, right? You don't have to face the person. You can take on a different name and uh, say complete lies about a person and destroy a person's reputation, uh, spread gossip about a person. Even the word gossip hisses like a snake. Have you ever noticed that? It's gossip. And there's something very appealing about it. I just heard something. And I don't know if it's true. But I just wanted to share it with you so you can pray. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you can pray. Wait, you just heard something. You don't know if it's true. And you're going to share it about someone. And I know it's going to be critical or demeaning or degrading. So why would I share something about someone that I don't know is true that can hurt that person? And what if that person is standing over there right now? Here's a thought, walk over to them and say, I heard the craziest thing. I know it's not true and they can tell you the truth but see, we'll embrace these things and internalize these things and even worse, worse 
spread these things. Don't, don't let that happen to you. These are not the things a Christian should be doing, especially a heavenly minded one. Listen, if you've put your faith in Christ, you're a child of God. You are a citizen of heaven and it's time to start living like what? A child of God. And we're not known for slander. We're known for love. We're not known for condemnation. We're known for forgiveness and restoration. That's who you want to be. You want to be that guy, that girl that people go to and say, you know, you're always fair-minded about these things. You're always compassionate. You're always caring. Don't be known as that mean-spirited, judgmental, harsh person. I'll talk more about that on Sunday. But be a heavenly-minded person. Because one day this life that we love so much will pass and we'll enter into the afterlife. I think when it's all said and done, here's what we really need. We need something greater to move us through this life than the things that distract us so often. An old minister put it this way. I love this phrase he used. The expulsive power of a new affection. That's good. The expulsive power of a new affection. So the idea is, I have something that I am so committed to and so enthralled with and so filled with that I don't even want to look at these other things. It's the expulsive power. It, it, it drives out those other things. It's a new affection. And what is a new affection? It's Jesus. And when I love Jesus with all of my heart and with all of my soul and with all of my mind, it's going to change the way I look at everything in life. So here's what this is really saying. Put the Lord first in every part of your life. And the thoughts you think. And the friends you choose. And the way you use your time. And it will transform you. Make every year, every month, every week, every day, and every hour count. May God give to each of us the expulsive power of a new affection. And may we begin, like never before, to think about and seek heaven. Because you know what the great thing is? Is when you're focused on heaven, you'll live the most fulfilling life on earth. To quote C.S. Lewis one last time, he said, aim at heaven and you get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither, end quote. That's true. Aim at heaven and you get earth thrown in. So the idea is, I'm so focused on heaven that I'm living the fullest life on earth. But some people, I don't want to think about the afterlife. I want to just get the most out of this life. And you end up not living a full life in this earth. And then you end up not being prepared for the afterlife. So how can you know for sure that you'll get to heaven? Some people would say, well, live a good life. Okay, that's not true. But let's just say it is true for the sake of a point. Live a good life. How good? Well, as good as I choose to live. Oh, I see. So you're making the rules? Well, of course I am. Well, that's not the way it works. Because even if you were to live a good life, and granted, some people live better lives than others, I'll admit, it's still not good enough to get you to heaven because one sin's enough to keep you out. The Bible says if you offend in one part of the law, you're guilty of all of it. So if you have ever sinned at any time in your life, that's enough sin to keep you out of heaven. You go, well, that, that's pretty harsh. Yeah, that is. There's, that's why there's only one way to get to heaven. And it's through Jesus who died on the cross for our sin and paid the price for our sin, and rose again, and now he offers us this gift of eternal life. Coming back to Disneyland one last time. Years ago, I was given, uh, I think, I can't remember, three or four tickets to Disneyland. And so we went into the park. It was very nice, because it's very expensive. It's, what is it, like $5,000 a ticket? Now I'm not sure. It's really a lot. And that's just one park, not both sides, right? So... And so I, I, I had these tickets, we got in, we're, we're starting to have a good time, and I felt guilty because one of the people didn't show up, and I had a free ticket to Disneyland, and I thought, I can't walk around with a free ticket to Disneyland. What if there's somebody outside that would love to come in and they can't afford it, and I could give them this ticket? And I said to my wife, I'll be back in like literally four minutes. How long is it gonna take me to get rid of a free ticket to Disneyland? I came back like 30 minutes later. She said, what happened to you? I said, I couldn't get anyone to take it. Because I walked up to strangers, hi, would you like a free ticket to Disneyland? And they started like backing away. Like, <laughs> what is this? Is this a cult? No, it's free ticket. You want it? No, I don't want it. Okay. 
Hey, would you like a free ticket to Disneyland? What's the catch? There's no catch here. Here, I want to give it to you. I just have an extra. The person, no, no one would take it. I finally had to assault a person. <laughs> no, I didn't, but I finally found someone that said, oh, thanks. Well, you're welcome. And I just lost a half an hour of my time in Disneyland. And that's how it is when we offer this gift. You can go to heaven by believing in Jesus. No, it's good works. No, it's not good works. It's his work on the cross. Now you just accept it. Oh, what's a catch? Well, I don't know what the catch is. I'm just telling you it's a gift. You can never afford it, so why don't you just take it? The gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then you can know you'll go to heaven. So look, do you know right now that if you died, you would go to heaven? If you don't, don't you want to get that resolved? Why would you want to go on for another minute without being sure you're prepared for the afterlife. So we're gonna pray in a moment. I'm gonna extend an invitation in closing for you to ask Christ to come into your life and forgive you of all of your sins so you can know you'll go to heaven when you die. If you don't know this for sure, respond to this invitation because 2,000 years ago, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross in our place and to pay the price for all the wrongs we've done, all the sins we've committed. And three days later, he rose again from the dead. And here he is now alive with us in this place, standing at the door of your life and knocking. And he says, if you'll hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. If you've never asked him to come in to your life, do it now as we pray. Let's all bow our heads. Father, thank you now for your word to us. Thank you for sending Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming and laying your life down for us. Now we pray for any here that do not yet know you. Help them to come to you. Help them to believe in you. Help them to receive the hope of heaven tonight, we would ask. Now while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we're praying together, how many of you would say this evening, Greg, I need Jesus in my life. I want him to forgive me of my sin. I want to know with certainty that I'll go to heaven when I die. I want this free gift he's offering to me. Pray for me if that's your desire. If you want Jesus to come into your life and you want him to forgive you of your sin, if you want to go to heaven when you die, would you raise your hand up right now wherever you are and I'll pray for you. God bless you. Lift your hand up high where I can see it, please. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, and God bless you. Raise it up high where I can see it, please. You're saying, I need Jesus tonight. Pray for me. I want to go to heaven. Pray for me. Raise your hand up high where I can see it, please. God bless you. Anybody else? There might be a few more. God bless you, too. God bless you. Anybody else? You haven't raised your hand yet, but you want to be right with God. You want to know you'll... Go to heaven when you die. Let me pray for you. Raise your hand up wherever you are. God bless you. I'll wait one more moment. Anybody else? If you haven't raised your hand yet, lift it now. Anybody else? Raise your hand now. All right. Now all of you that have raised your hand, if you would please, I want you to stand to your feet and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Stand to your feet and I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. If you raise your hand, even if you did not, but you want Jesus Christ to come into your life, you want him to forgive you of your sin? You want to go to heaven when you die? Just stand to your feet and we'll pray together. Stand up. You heard me right. God bless you that are standing. There's a few more of you that need to stand, I think. Why don't you stand now? And I'll lead you in this prayer of asking Christ to come into your life. Anybody else, stand now. Let me pray with you. You will not regret this. God bless you that are standing. I'll wait one more moment. God bless you. Anybody else? Stand up. We'll pray together. All right. All of you that are standing, I'm going to pray a prayer out loud, and I'm going to ask you to pray it out loud after me. This is where you're asking Jesus to forgive you of your sin and come into your life, give you the hope of heaven. So as I pray, pray this out loud right where you stand. Just pray these words if you would. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. But I know you're the Savior who died on the cross for my sin and rose again from the dead. 
I turn from my sin now, Jesus. And I choose to follow you from this moment forward as my Savior and Lord, as my God and friend. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless each one of you that prayed that prayer. God bless you guys. All right.